Hello, good evening. I think I'll start making some announcement first before the, um, the lecture start and introduce the speaker this evening. Well, it's a rare chance we have a lecture on the 29th of February, and it's a rare chance that I met this speaker on a trip by Salam Society last year, so we invited him to talk. Anyway, before that, this Saturday is the first activity for the 20, um, 120th anniversary of Salam Society. It's a special lecture on the five oldest Thai poems, Love, Laws, and Landscape, a talk by Chris Baker and Paso Pong Pai Jit. So please come, it's at 2 p.m. Then, on 13th of March, we have a piano recital by Philippe Guillon Herbert with music by Nikolai Rimsky, Korsakov, Franz Schubert, Claude Debussy, and Maurice Ravel. It's at 7 p.m. Later in March, on 14th of March, we have three speakers on philosophies of appropriated religions, perspectives from Southeast Asia, a talk by Sorat Hongladarom, Jeremiah Hoven Joaquin, and Dr. Frank J. Hoffman. It's one of our um, council members. Then later in March, 21st of March, One Planet, One Chance, a talk by Joaquin Oldenburg. We still have other things, such as trips to Kashmir, Pakistan, and Gansu in China. So please sign up. If um, they're full, then just put your name on the waiting list. Now, as I told you, I met Dr. Jer um, Jerome Samuel on a trip last year um, to Sim, Semisan. And lo and behold, towards um, the end of the trip, we thought, why don't you come and talk on something? And it turns out he actually an expert or um, one of the experts on things, Indonesian, Indonesian languages, uh, Bahasa language, and among these, reverse glass painting. Now, he also has some in his collection, and he studied over 2,500 of them. Now, um, you can read all his illustrious um, bio on the, announce on the announcement here. But anyway, thank you very much for um, giving us a talk this evening. Please well, give a warm welcome to Jerome Samuel. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, Siam Society for giving me the opportunity to, to present a, a lesser known uh, kind of popular art, which is uh, reverse glass painting, which is practiced in Indonesia, has been for a long time, still at now, to now, and which uh, can be seen here in Thailand too in Vietnam, Cambodia, Burma, in several countries, several Southeast Asian countries. So, but uh, today I will uh, focus my talk on Tavni's uh, uh, reverse class painting. And um, um, my talk will deal mainly with the link between glass painting, the use of glass painting, the making of glass painting, since the last decades of the 19th century and the 20th century until the Saturday, let's say the 1970s, the link between the glass paintings painted during this range of uh, a span of time and modernity, and the kind of modernity which is not exclusively related to the Western modernity, uh, but other Asian modernities. And um, so I will not give a general overview of uh, Javanese uh, glass painting, which may be, will be a little bit frustrating for some of you, but I apologize before. 
So, uh, uh, but it will give you an idea of uh, what is that, uh, that art. Uh, anyway, um, glass painting, of the use of glass to be painted was, uh, let's say, invented in the, during the Roman Empire and developed in the, during the Middle Ages in Europe, uh, specifically in Italy. But it found its way from Europe to Asia. There are several ways, actually, uh, since the 17th century until the 20th century. I would say that the, the first route, important one, is the Italian route by the Jesuit from Italy to China. And maybe for the 17th century, from the Netherlands to Batavia, to Java, to Jakarta. And then the Chinese painters, of course, uh, played an important role in uh, producing a lot of glass painting in the southern port of uh, China and exporting it all over the world, including to uh, Indonesia and to uh, uh, Batavia. Um, at first, it was a, pro a luxury product, uh, imported by the, uh, the, the, the Dutch uh, uh, company, the VOC, and imported to be given as gifts to kings or to princes uh, in Southeast Asia, including in Thailand too, 17th, 18th century. We know that there were glass painting in Batavia in the late 18th century. Part of it imported by the Dutch, others imported by Chinese for displaying in their houses. We have no pieces, but we have proofs, different kind of proofs. Mm. Speaking about uh, glass painting, we take this chronological timeline and we have to divide it in two parts. Here, I do not begin in the 17th century because actually what's interesting for me is when did Javanese painters begin to paint on glass, on the, the reverse part of uh, side of glass, paint on glass for the Javanese themselves, not for foreigners, not for the Dutch, Chinese, something else. And this began approximately in the late 1870s or early 1880s. So we have two parts uh, uh, for these uh, more than two, uh, more than one and a half century. The first is what I call traditional Japanese glass painting or reverse glass painting, RGP, until the mid 70s. And then began another uh, uh, history of glass painting, which is linked with a, uh, uh, a conscient revival of it by the Indonesian state. But my talk today will deal with the first part with traditional Javanese reverse glass painting only. With, and between both, you have different themes, different styles, the status of the paintings and the status of the painters differs too. But I want to elaborate uh, about this. Now, <clears throat> what part of the island of Java are involved in the production of glass painting? It's mainly the, that part of Java which is culturally Javanese and Madurese. You have three different languages and three different cultures in the island of Java. Java, when I speak of Java, this includes the, the small island of Madura too. The Sundanese on the west, Javanese in the uh, central and east of Java, and the Madurese mainly in the island of Madura and the eastern part of Java. Practically, Javanese and Madurese only were interested in buying, displaying glass paintings. On the western part, we have glass paintings, but mainly commissioned owned and displayed by Arabs from the Hadrami uh, community in Indonesia and Chinese, not by the Sundanese. Don't ask me why, please. <laughs> and um, if we focus on the uh, shorter span of time when the, the glass painting was at its highest in Java, that is approximately 30, uh, three decades, 30 years, um, a lot of pieces were painted everywhere. I, th I guess millions of it. Uh, 
This means that glass painting were just another kind of furniture, like chairs, tables, beds, for different purposes, for decoration and for other purposes. I will explain uh, further later. And this, once again, mainly for the uh, 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 Japanese uh, public. And this, at that time, didn't really interest uh, the, uh, uh, the colonials. They were practically not aware about glass paintings. They didn't see it, most of them. So we find very few literature produced and published during the, 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 that time, the, 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 the colony, on uh, glass painting. And this makes a huge difference between other popular art like batik, which was, of course, obviously well known by the Dutch, or the uh, 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 chris, or whatever, basket trees. This was uh, uh, really well known by the Dutch, but glass paintings, no, nothing. They were not interested in it. I have collected uh, glass painting not as much as the figure you can see here. It's, uh, but I began to build up a, a database of Japanese glass painting since uh, approximately 20 years ago for the, the sake of research. And I have a very small collection of uh, glass painting, a very small one, which I keep partly in Paris and most of it are kept in Indonesia actually. And uh, this, it's based on that database and that uh, paintings I have documented, which I can elaborate and uh, make research and explain and explore shorter, smaller corpuses with different topics. So all the paintings I present here, first, are dealing with the traditional uh, uh, period of glass painting and um, are taken from my uh, database. And this is approximately 1,500 items. Now, if we think about the way of the production of glass painting and the, the place and the, of glass, glass besides other uh, uh, medium, there are important things to, to, to say, to explain before. First, glass is just one medium among others. At that time, and and now we change a little bit, but formally and until the 1980s, the painters, they paint on whatever they get. It can be leather, cardboard, paper, glass, zinc, whatever. And they always try to use the cheapest medium they can get. Until the 1960s, glass was quite expensive, although the price was declining and began to decline approximately during the 1920s, 1930s. At the beginning of the 19th century, 20th century, the uh, middle class, urban middle class, they were able to buy it. It was not too expensive for, the, for them. But for the peasant, it was still something else. But during the 1930s, right before the World War II, peasants too were able, it was affordable for them, Small glass paintings, rapidly made, maybe not really well made, but anyway, it was affordable for themselves. And it's still affordable until the 1960s, until the end of the success of glass painting in Java. Here you have an example of a, uh, a figure, Arjuna, a figure of the, the Javanese uh, um, shadow theater and taken from the, the Mahabharata. And, um, of course, the main important item is in the mill. So the puppet, the puppet is used uh, uh, for, the, uh, to, for their play. But the same figure can appear on wood here, which is a, it's a uh, wooden board for, for Chris, and or glass on the left. Glass was very appealing, not only because it was rare and expensive, but it was linked to modernity. We have to keep in mind that it was a material of modernity since the mid-19th century. And it changed in the second part of the 20th century 
whereby the glass was replaced by plastic. So it was very appealing for this reason and for intrinsic qualities, visual qualities of the glass itself. Reflecting something, giving a special uh, shape of the colors to the colors. So it was really modern, appealing, interesting in showing a status of someone being able to, uh, uh, financially able to buy and to display it at home. So this can explain the, 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 uh, the success of glass. Um, these three pieces have been made in the region of Cherbon on the northern coast of uh, uh, Java. It's uh, in the western part, but northern coast of, uh, of Java. And yes, I have to get back. Usually that kind of paintings were made by puppeters, Dalai. Why? Because they know the characters. They know what the shape of these heroes of the theater, of the uh, uh, shadow theater, because the, 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 the character is exactly the same on leather and on glass. So most, not all, but a large part of glass painting representing uh, uh, heroes of uh, the, uh, the shadow theater or scenes of the shadow theater were painted by puppeters or by people who made the puppets too. We see a completely different uh, 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 situation with uh, workshops producing a lot of glass paintings and these workshops have been uh, proven to exist in the region of uh, uh, Jakarta and Surakarta in the 1930s. Here you have uh, um, views of mosque. Mosque, except uh, um, this is uh, Mecca, and all the others are mosques. And this is a mosque in central Java. Others are mosques. This is a mosque in, in Jakarta. The others are mosques on the northern coast of central Java too. Um, you, if you uh, pay attention to the frieze, you can see two kinds, well, one kind of frieze here, and this is the kind of signature by the workshop, by the painters. All use the same frieze except one, whereby the, the frieze have been simplified, but anyway, all must have been and have been effectively painted in the same place by the same set of painters. So we have individual producers and small workshops. But the main uh, uh, part, a uh, percentage of the paintings were produced by individual producers, by puppeters and other painters. Regarding the use, uh, at first we would say that the glass painting were used to, for display, of course, just for decoration. This is not the case. I think that most of it were painted with specific purposes, like here, what we can see with the Arabic calligraphy, showing a status. If you display a calligraphy in Arabic in your house, this is a way to say, I am a Muslim and religion is important to me. And beside this, the calligraphy is a protective device from anything bad which could happen to the house. This is a protective figure specific to the uh, region of Cherbon. And uh, if we can see it closer, it's actually an Islamized version of Ganesh. It's a Ganesh, actually. Ganesh, the face, an elephant one, but wearing a sword. And usually the uh, uh, Shahada is written uh, there is no God by God, and Muhammad is his, uh, 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 his uh, prophet, is written on the, on the painting. And uh, the same is true, too, for uh, partly for painting representing uh, uh, figures or heroes of the Mahabharata, of the Ramayana, whereby the people are placed, they place themselves, or they, they put one hero which they consider as their own hero, they consider having a specific link with that character. They put it in the house, and they put it too, and we, it's proven with, uh, from other sources that 
uh, figure of uh, uh, some characters of the, uh, uh, the, the, the shadow theater were used to uh, protect some places against thieves, for instance. Now, now I will focus on this specific link between glass painting and modernity. And um, I begin with uh, or by linking glass painting and photography. Both are related. And first we begin with non-Japanese glass painting. These are Japanese. Made in Japan, produced in Japan, partly for export. Um, most of that, kind, that kind of glass painting were produced in the late Meiji era, the last decades of the 19th century, and still produced maybe until the 1920s, maybe later. You will find that kind of glass paintings imported by Japanese living in Southeast Asia, not only in Indonesia, but other parts of Southeast Asia. And what interests me here is here, it's a mixed media painting. You have here, Mother of Pearl. And here, you have small photographs of geisha put on the back of the glass and combined with the painting. And this is interesting because the, the mixing photography and glass and painted glass was not very popular in Europe. This was invented by Japanese painters, according to the Japanese taste. It's a kind of agency. They use techniques taken from Europe, and they use it, and they make something else which fits with their taste. This, uh, and for, as for youth itself, this is an altar for the cult of ancestors. I found it in, a, in, in Chorobot again, in a house owned by the Chinese family. The, main, uh, the first purpose of these paintings was just for decorative purpose, completely unrelated with any kind of cult, of course. And this is not Chinese, but the owner of these paintings and the, uh, the lady who was uh, owning this, this house, she was convinced that that are Jap Chinese painting, not Japanese. We will see the same agency in another part of the world, Senegal. Senegal is very well known until now uh, for the, its production of glass painting, which are called sous-verre, behind glass. It's sous-verre, it comes from French language. Sous-verre, sous-verre. And um, here we see that the, the Senegalese uh, painters, according to Senegalese taste, they mix, once again, painting and photography. The, the painting being used to as a kind of staging for the, for the pictures, portraits mainly, here and here. We have birds and flower, and birds and flower, uh, peacocks are very common in Islam and in, in Indonesia as well. In Java, the use of the mixing of photography and glass painting is completely different. They do not mix, actually, but they are so close. This is a photography of a, the, the Sultan Hamankubono uh, the Eighth, who was the Sultan of Jakarta. We have to keep in mind that photography was introduced in Java in the 1840s, and it became rapidly very popular amongst the, the palace, princes, nobility. It became accessible to let's say, higher middle class by the end of the 19th century, either Chinese or Japanese, and it became accessible to the many, not before the independence era, in the 1950s, 1960s. So for many decades, most of the people in Java, the peasants or workers, they couldn't afford it. It was too expensive for them. So they painted it on glass. And here we have the example 
of a, a sultan. I, I wouldn't, probably it's Amenko Buono VIII. I'm not sure, actually. As you can see the face of the sultan here, there is, it's very impersonal. It's just the king, the sovereign, with a big S, that's all. Not a specific sultan, but a sultan, the ID of sovereignty, the ID of uh, uh, the sultan, sitting on the throne. So the, the photography was accessible for few people. That kind of pictures were print and published in journals, in magazines, in magazines, but of course, most of the Javanese people living in the, in the countryside, they couldn't read and they couldn't buy uh, newspapers or magazines, but they could reproduce the pictures on glass. And it lasted a long time. Another example of glass painting, not reproducing, strictly speaking, but inspired by uh, 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 photography, Yes, this one, an officer, a Dutch officer. Here, I, I wouldn't say that this is the same guy. Of course not. But the idea is behind this. To try to reproduce in glass something which is taken from photography. And we must remind or keep in mind that actually at that time, I mean in the late 19th century, glass was used by photographers, of course. Uh, and it was used to protect photography and paper or any kind of lithograph when you want to display it somewhere. You have to protect it with a sheet of glass. So that's what people uh, uh, did at that time. I would like to underline two things, uh, or one thing. It's the taste for details. As you can see here, not only the uniform, but this is a wash basin or something like that. This is... Uh, A furniture in the in the maybe in the in the in the bathroom or something else, but it's much it is much detailed, much much detailed, and this until now or for all of the time remains something very important for the Japanese painters. Now something else. I'm still speaking about the presentation of human face, not God's face. Uh, but here we have portraits of couple portraits. It's slightly different with what are presented with the uh, two slides before. The portraits. Here again, the model comes from the palace. For instance, here you have the Sultan and his wife, Pakubuono Ten, and his wife, the Sultan of Surakarta of Solo. This painting must have been deeply inspired by this photograph, specifically, I would say, specifically. And beside this, this kind of painting, you have other representation of couples, not taken from the palace, but taken from ordinary couples, wealthy couples maybe, but ordinary couples living in the cities, for instance, this one. And this, as well as that one, this one, this is a specific couple. You can see the, the, the glasses, the moustache, the clothes. It's not any, any couple. It's not just the idea of a couple. This is Mr. A and Mrs. B. We don't know the name, but these people must, must have existed. In a way, not completely. In my database, I have another painting, same couple, no glasses, different colors for the, for the clothes. So the painters were used to use uh, models on paper and they reproduced it on glass, changing the colors, changing the, the, the face, moustache, and uh, glasses, uh, etc., etc. So these are portraits of couples. Married couples, of course. This is something else. We have a couple here, but it's not an ordinary couple. 
This is a, a couple of deities. Dewisri on the left and Sadono on the right. It's a couple of deities, a god and a goddess, who are guaranteeing the prosperity and the fecundity of the couple. And um, this shows the status too. As we can see, they are, they, they, they are adorned and, they, they, and they, uh, they, 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 the clothes they are wearing are specifically used for the wedding, for the wedding only. And the faces are completely anonymous. The difference between one and another lies on the kind of the, the clothes which are related with the subregion where the paintings has been, have been made or where the couple uh, uh, stays or lives. So this, uh, this is inspired by that kind of photograph once again. Here we have, we have a real couple. I think that these pictures may have, must have been taken in a palace somewhere. Very worthy people, of course. You can see the building, you can see the decoration. And um, at that time, uh, until the, of, uh, during, uh, in the past time, until the mid 20th century, um, in a lot of houses, Javanese houses, you had representation of these couples, the uh, Wisri uh, and Sadono, the Loro Blonio is the name of the couple itself, mostly uh, on wood, preserved as uh, uh, being real deities, which are protecting the, 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 the couple and the, and the family. I don't know when um, the people producing such uh, uh, items they shift from a three-dimensional representation to a two-dimensional representation. My hypothesis is the use of glass and the representation on two dimension instead of three uh, was inspired what, by what we have seen before with couples and portraits of people. And as another example of uh, the use of glass and the link between glass and photographs, you have these postcards on glass, obviously reproduced from photographs. This was not so popular as the portraits and the couple, the divine couple we've seen before. I must add regarding the divine couple I've mentioned before, this is an important part of my corpus you will find hundreds of that kind of paintings. We can say that practically most of the, maybe not all, but most of the houses uh, of established couples in Java had that kind of picture inside, the Wisri and Sadono. It was really, really very popular, and not only because of a trend or because it was fashionable, but because of the meaning of these two deities combined together, showing the status of the family and protecting the house, and as ensuring the fecundity and the fertility and the prosperity of the, of the family. So this is completely different. This comes once again from Cherbon, kind of greetings from Cherbon. What's in interesting here, these have been produced in the Arab community of Cherbon, Arab taste is not, taste is not the same as Japanese. They are not interested in figures, but in landscapes, like this one. And interestingly here is first the use of Arabic script instead of the Japanese, but they are Arabs. Here again, this is the name of the place here, as written here. So this is Lingarjati and this is Chibulan. Both are places for rest or for pleasure in West Java. And the, the, here, what's mentioned, what's explained here, uh, in Indonesian, which means 
on sale at our fan shop, Jagabayan, which is the name of the road. So it's, it's kind of advertisement uh, 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 altogether. This is slightly different. We have to forget uh, photographs and we move to print pictures, print in the local press, in the Malay speaking or Javanese speaking press, in the Dutch Indies in the 1920s until the 1940s. And uh, this is a way to introduce people or to or to explain what's, how far the Javanese people from the middle, higher middle class, urban classes, did adapt a westernized uh, a lifestyle, as we can see here, with the, the tie, the jacket, combined with the, uh, the kain here, sarong or kain here. These are very well-known uh, figures, uh, Garen here, Petruk here, very well known, known, taken from the Shadow Theater too. They are actually, they are very old, minor, but very old gods, uh, Javanese gods, very old. And uh, beside the, the clothes they do use here, they, they use it, they mix it, the Javanese and Western, they use it in their daily life or in special occasion like this. Both are the same. Go to the visit to elders after the feasting month, Silaturahmi. But you can see here um, devices which are emblematic of modernity, like the, the, the clockwise here, the clock here, the uh, electricity, and in other paintings you will find the uh, radio something like this. So um, they are completely um, mixing on unequal feet, but mixing uh, and adapting and changing uh, uh, Western material modernity and bring brought into the uh, Javanese, uh, Javanese world. And this is an important uh, figure of the of the Javanese theater to Sumar. The, the model here on paper was published in the Javanese speaking newspaper written in Javanese character two in 1936. This must have been painted in the 1950s, 1960s. So these pictures remain popular for more than 20 years, actually. Another one with this this is the same, the same uh, uh, draftsman, the same illustrator, uh, B. Margono, published in 1941, and this painting have been made in the 50s, I think, maybe later, maybe later, and we find again these two figures, Petruk and Gareng, playing football, and in specific position, we can see uh, the, the, the features of these two uh, uh, characters, the, the belly here, uh, the nose, of course, and the leg. His right leg is shorter than the right. The right leg is shorter than the leg. So now we move to the second part. And it's another link between glass painting and modernity I will show here. So with whereby uh, glass painting is uh, related to print media, once again, but originating for different places, and more importantly, maybe, with Islam. Glass painting is basically an art of copying, not in Java only, but in Europe too, it was the same. It's very easy to copy a picture from paper to glass. You just have to put it below, the, behind the glass, and you paint it. And you can even copy from glass to glass. It's very easy. So if you are uh, qualified enough, you can produce a large amount of glass painting. It's not, not very expensive. What's expensive is not the time spent in, 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 in painting, in, in making the paint picture itself. What's expensive is the material, actually, not the work. 
So this is the copy of a, a pilgrim certificate. Yeah, a pilgrim certificate, uh, as a lot of it have been uh, printed and given to pilgrims in the uh, Holy Lands uh, since the, the late 19th century, maybe a little bit earlier, until the mid uh, 20th century. Um, there are few changes between the original here on paper and this reproduction. The main is here, there are four parts here, just three, okay. But the most important parts are these three ones and this one. The certificate has to be read from right to left. The pilgrimage, the Hajj, begins. It begins at Mecca. Uh, and it is at his highest, not in Mecca itself, but around Mecca. Which is a, a pilgrims are reborn at that time in Mecca. It's a symbolic die, a symbolic death, and symbolic rebirth which happened in Mecca during the Hajj, during the, the Hajj. Uh, the, the term of Hajj is more specific and more precise than uh, uh, pilgrimage uh, itself. In the middle here, you have uh, Medina, because after Mecca, the pilgrims, they go to Medina, which is the place where I lived for years and where died the prophet Muhammad. And they go there to pay homage and to pray in front of the tomb of the prophet. And this is an important moment. This is not compulsory. This only, this part is compulsory. The other parts of the pilgrimage are not. So they go to Medina, and then you have, what you have here is Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem, it marks the end of the time, the apocalypse, way off. And the place where all people will die and then reborn again at the, end of the, at the end of the times. I don't know why, but the painter, he doesn't have reproduced Medina here in this triptych. So we have a kind of uh, equilibrium in the triptych, but the triptych is very static. Mecca in the middle, Jerusalem in left and right, and it has lost its meaning, actually. Actually, it should be read in a much more dynamic way, beginning in Mecca and ending in Jerusalem here. Another version, another glass painting representing the Kaaba in Mecca. This, the, the former one was seen from outside. It's a plain, a flat representation. This one here, you see the Kaaba in Mecca seen from inside the courtyard. But what's most interesting here is that Many, many prints have been produced and have circulated all over the world, actually. Printed mostly in Turkey, in Syria, or in, in Egypt, and uh, were sold to pilgrims. All of these are uh, uh, pilgrim uh, certificates. And brought by pilgrims to Northern Africa, or to... Uh, Middle East, this is a painting made after the same model, but this has been made by a Chinese painter, a Muslim Chinese painter, of course. And now here in the middle, you have the Javanese version. What we can see here is first, the captions here, the surah, are much shorter which is understandable because very few people at that time were able to read and to, uh, to write in Arabic. They had to try to find the models. And sometimes they make mistakes. i show one mistake later. This is interesting because there is a signature. We don't know the name. We just know that the guy, the name of the guy was R-T-J-K, the initials. We don't know, or as a first part of the name, probably it was someone from the nobility. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a title of nobility. And very few glass painting, uh, generally speaking, are, uh, um, have a signature on it. So 
So now we move to Medina with a very old model. This is the model. This, that kind of paintings are, have been seen by uh, travelers, European travelers, in the mid-19th century. So it's, it's quite old. And you can see the whole city of Medina with, at the middle, you have the, the mosque with the tomb of the prophet, its cupola, the green cupola. Of course, actually, in Medina at that time, the courtyard of the, of the, uh, of the mosque was that's as big as it is here. But here, the courtyard has been enlarged and is almost as big as the city. And the city is surrounded by ramparts, walls, here. And this is a cemetery, a very well-known cemetery, Al-Baki, outside of the city. So um, this reproduces very closely an original, maybe this one, maybe another one, but it reproduces it. it. This one is a little bit different. We get back to uh, Mecca, and we can see that the presentation of Mecca have been simplified. This is not the model, of course, but usually in the Middle East, this is the model or the way or the way of representing Mecca and the Kaaba in the city. You have the, the, the mosque, the big one. Here is the city. Of course, this is not really realistic, not at all. Huh? But at least you have the main courtyard and the courtyard here at the top and another small one on the left side or right side here. And eight uh, towers, minar, eight. This one has been simplified. Uh, the number of uh, uh, towers of minar, I don't know the word in English, minar. Yeah, the number of minar have been reduced to four, from seven to four, for the sake of symmetry. And uh, this number, four, is the same as the number of the main pillars, sacred pillars, in the Javanese mosque. Well. So you have a symmetry here, produced by Javanese painters, which is different from the models. No symmetry here. No back and side courtyards. And um, we must uh, uh, underline two things. First, this convey the idea of uh, concentricity with the, 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 the building, with the part of the courtyard, and radiance, some th things originating from the center, from the Kaaba, and uh, heading to uh, uh, different directions with this, uh, this, this color uh, here. And the other thing is um, the use of red and white, which are the colors of the, the, the Indonesian flag. The, my hypothesis is the painter of this painting could have uh, had the idea of bringing up nationalist ideas in a very discreet way. But this means something, the use of black and white, of white and red and white. I mentioned earlier that sometimes the, the, the Arabic sentences of word are uh, written by someone who do not uh, understand the Arabic. And here, I'm not sure, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that here, what's written here, it's not a surah, it's just to mention that this painting of this print, this picture, have been produced with the, the fees paid by Sheikh someone. So it was just a commercial mention unrelated with religion. This is much more diver diverging. This is Medina. It's a strange Medina because the courtyard here and here, it's Mecca, it's not Medina. If we see, if we have a look to the walls, it is Medina. Here is the city. Inside you have the mosque and here you have the walls around the city. So it mixes both. And as for the number of uh, Mindaray too, it's a mix. 
the, uh, the tomb of the prophet with, with its cupola in the center is not right. The Kaaba in Mecca is in the center, but actually the tomb of the prophet in Medina is in the corner here, not in the center. And more important too, the courtyard have been divided by fences and gates. And this is what we can see in sub-sanctuaries in Java. Sanctuaries, Javanese, purely Javanese sanctuaries, Islamized, but Javanese sanctuaries, with a succession of, of courtyards. And you go from a courtyard to another one, and at the end, at the end of the walk, you find the tomb of the saint. So uh, this is a completely Javanized representation of Medina. And which gives a, an utmost importance to the tomb of the prophet. As if to pray around the tomb of the prophet is more important than to pray in front of the Kaaba in Mecca. According to religion, of course it's not the case. But people have a special feeling and really a special love to the prophet. And they can express it by giving a higher importance to uh, 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 Medina instead of Mecca. So, once again, the reorganization of the space here, the symmetry, relocation of the prophet's tomb, the courtyards. So this mixed both Mecca and Medina, but it's much more prophet-oriented than uh, to the Kaaba. The last of this series is a representation of the inner courtyard of the uh, 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 Mosque of Medina. Here is a cupola with the tomb of the prophet. What must uh, underline here is this. This is a coat of arms. The coat of arms of, of the Ottoman. The Ottoman. And the Ottoman were the protectors of the uh, Holy Lands at that time. They had a, uh, um, officers acting in and governing in Mecca as well as in Medina. But Medina was much more important for them. First, it's closer to the, uh, the, the, the other parts of the, of the empire, of course. But the, during the 19th century, they tried to enlarge and to embellish the city. They repaired the walls. They made new walls and new entrance, new gates, and they spend a lot of, uh, of efforts and, and, and money to embellish the city of Medina. So we can say that Medina is a kind of, it's, it's an Ottoman city too, and it is a Sultanian city, whereby the, the Caliph and the Sultan, both the same person actually, are present and clearly visible in the city of Medina, which is not the case in Mecca. So, um, this is important, and um, now uh, we move to another part, and in that part I begin by speaking about the coat of arms of the sultans. And if we speak about the sultans, uh, the empire, or the sultan, the caliph, politics are not very far, of course, even in Indonesia, or maybe uh, specifically in Indonesia. So this is the original coat of arms of uh, the Ottoman. And it was invented in 1882 and commissioned by Abdul Hamid uh, II, the, maybe the, uh, uh, the most well-known uh, uh, sultans and caliph of the 19th and 20th century, which was... Uh, Westernized in a way, and who uh, uh, was considered by the Westerners as a threat because he wanted to promote the idea of pan Islamism. And this was a threat for the French in Northern Africa, for the Dutch in the Dutch Indies, and for other uh, uh, colonial, uh, and for the British in India, of course. Uh, they were afraid by the possibility of the Muslim world unifying and trying to fight against the Westerners. This is the Javanese version of the coat of arms, almost the same, not very different. One difference 
is here. This is the signature of the Sultan. Okay. This is a real one. Each Sultan has his own signature. Tugra. The name is Tugra. This one is a fancy one. Not very serious. And made by someone who doesn't know what he's representing, actually. He tries to imitate. It's kind of imitation, that's all. More important is here, what's written here. Here, you have a, uh, 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 the sentence in Arabic, relying on divine success, the king of the sublime Ottoman state. Okay, this is Ottoman. But here, what's written here, it's completely different. It's the name of the seven sleepers. Maybe you have heard about the seven sleepers. No? It's the... Um, it's a legend uh, from Turkey, the region of Ephesus. And the story runs as uh, this. There was seven youngsters at the time of the Roman Empire, and they, uh, they, uh, they wanted to escape a bad king who wanted to kill all Christians. And they went to the mountain, they uh, hiding in the cavern, and then there they fell asleep. And when they wake up, they went to the city and they discovered that between the time they fell asleep and the time they wake up, uh, more than 300 years has left. Have left. Yeah. And after that, they decide to get back to the cavern and just to die. They have been given by God the possibility of die, rebirth, and then they die again. They want to, okay, to, to get back to, uh, to, uh, to God at all. The same story has been taken by, by Islam, by the Muslims. It's one, uh, uh, um, uh, one surah, actually, which then is the people of the cavern, the, the, the title of the surah. The story is a little bit different, but anyway, basically it's the same. The main difference being you have the Christian version and you have the Muslim one. That's all. The seven sleepers have names. Uh, they have uh, uh, Greek names. And these Greek names have been Arabized uh, uh, and are written here. Seven names and additionally one name, the name of the dog which was with this, uh, these uh, seven sleepers in the cavern. The name of the dog is Kitmir. And these are very potent words and names, protective ones, helping people. Not in Java only, in Egypt formerly too. In Turkey, in the Ottoman times, the name of the sleepers were, was protection for the navy, for the Turkish, the Ottoman navy. In some places, in uh, 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 Cairo, the name of the sleepers was uh, uh, pronounced each Friday before the big prayer in order to protect it from anything bad which could happen during that time. So it's an apotropaic, apotropaic device here, protective device, in Java as well as in the Middle East. This is unrelated or largely unrelated with the coat of arms. But this is a protective painting. We can see a kind of, well, a shield in the middle. Wings. Wings are symbol of eternity. The shield with here the name of the prophet in a, uh, uh, with an axis of symmetry. That way of writing the name of the prophet Muhammad is not, is not known in Java only, but in other places, in other parts of the uh, uh, Muslim world. This is not a taman, this is not a coat of arms, but this kind of painting were displayed to protect homes. And so this is a kind of proof that, yes, the uh, Ottoman coat of arms was used with different purposes. One was a political one, of course, if you display the Ottoman coat of arms at your home at that time, this is a way of saying that you feel closer to the caliph and the sultan instead of the Dutch power. Why? Because since the mid-19th century, 
until the early 20th century, many Malay states, Malay sultans, in, the, in Sumatra, in Riau, in the peninsula, in Aceh, they called the sultan for getting help from him. So this help never came up, but they called repeatedly to get help from the sultan. And so this is why I say, uh, uh, this is a, a political statement against the, uh, the colonials, against the Dutch. You will find the same idea here. You can see the Tugra is even uh, fancier or really strange. What's important here is this. Two small flags. Basically, you have two big flags. The green one, Islam. The red one, for the caliph. The red one for the sultan, Ottoman. But here you have two small flags, Jap Japanese flags. Why? In 1905, the, ja the, the Japan defeated the Russian during the, 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 Russo, the, the war between Russia and, and, and Japan. And Russians were defeated, and beginning from that time, the European uh, powers, they began to consider differently Japan. This victory from uh, Japan upon the Russian, upon a, a, a Western country, has been known everywhere in the colonial world, including in Indonesia. For the first time, a non-Western country were defeated by an Asian one. And even in some places, like in, in Riau, the sultan and the people tried to, they began to seek help, not from the sultan, but from the Japanese. The Ottoman had just uh, these, these very prestigious buildings too. This is the palace of uh, the Ottoman in, uh, in Istanbul. This is dated 1903. Um, this is not related with political ideas, but much more with um, popular literature, romances, stories, translated from Dutch or from German to Malay in the late 19th and early 20th century for the pleasure of people. So this is uh, a little bit different. And here you have the Javanese version of the palace of the Sultan in Istanbul, which is represented, which resembles a lot with the presentation of Mecca, actually, with these buildings on right and left. In the middle, something which doesn't look like a palace, much more like a mosque, a kind of mosque with a cupola, although there is a cross, but this is not a cross, actually. And with the train here. The train is important, and the train is related with the Ottoman and with pilgrimage. We'll see later. With the Ottoman, this is the train, as explained here, in Malay with Arabic script, this is a train entering Medina Al Munawara station from Dimash al Sham. So the train from Damascus to Medina. This train was built at the end of the 19th century and finished in the beginning of the 20th century by Abdulhamid II. I spoke about the last big sultan of the Ottoman. It was a huge project. He tried to get financing from everywhere in the Muslim world. The train was mainly intended to bring pilgrims from Turkey or from Palestine to Medina. Not the Indonesian. The Indonesian, they came by sea, not by the train. But this is uh, a very prestigious enterprise. Of course, the, uh, the railway station in Medina is not big as it is. It is completely uh, Idealistic. It's, I don't know. It's, both are completely unrelated. It's a, it's a small railway station, very small one, actually. We have pictures. Probably made in 1910, by the time the train was uh, in operation, which ended at the beginning of the uh, World War I. This is a fascination for the political power of the Sultan and a fascination for instruments of modernity, mechanical modernity. 
Another example here. Oh, no, this is the place of the two grand. Uh, so this is a Sultanian train, of course. Here, with the caption here in, uh, in Arabic script and in Malay. This is the boat uh, warship, a dreadnought used by Mustafa Kemal, so Ataturk, maybe, maybe not. In Istanbul, you can see the lander tower here. It's just, everything is very realistic. And uh, this is a way to show that the, uh, the power of Turkey, the military power of Turkey, we have to, 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 to keep in mind that at that time, warships, uh, cruisers, dreadnoughts were as impressive and important as are the nuclear weapons now. Uh, You have the name of the painter here. Once again, as you have seen earlier, the name of the shop, the place of the shop, an explanation, any kind of picture can be commissioned and by a boat here. Now uh, I finish with the, the fourth part, modernity, Islam and politics, but luckily, and related with the Ottomans or with Japan or whatever. This is the great mosque of Damak. This is a train. Damak is the main place for pilgrimage in Java. If you cannot afford a travel, traveling to Mecca, you go to Damak repeatedly. I don't remember exactly five times or maybe seven times. It's the same as one, uh, uh, one time to, uh, to Mecca. It's a, a pilgrimage for f a substitution, a substitute of the, of the Hajj for the Javanese. Still very popular until now. Why do we have the train here? The train conveyed the idea of travel and at the basis uh, of, of, of pilgrimage, you have travel. No travel, no pilgrimage. People gather from all the islands once a year. And once a year they travel there. They meet there at the same time at the time of the Hajj in Mecca. And you have two important places in this city of Damak. One which is uh, uh, representing, representing as a symbol Mecca. The other one representing Medina. So there is a parallelism, a strong parallelism between what happened in the Holy Land at the same time as the pilgrimage in the Mac. This painting must have been made during the Dutch era because of the frieze, really very elaborated. And you can see three colors. This is the Dutch flag, of course. And the train. And once again, we find something which is very realistic. You can see the faces of the people in the... Uh, in the coaches, you can see the, this is uh, um, not for electricity, but for uh, telegraphs or telephones. And you even can see a kite here. And this happens so frequently. Uh, 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 the children playing with kite, and the kite is kept by the, uh, by the wires. So the building is not very realistic, but uh, you have the lower part of the painting is really very realistic and it's really made uh, according to the, 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 the coaches and the, uh, and the trains which were used in Java at that time. After the independence of Indonesia, the taste for the great the mosque of Damak um, declined very rapidly. And uh, that mosque of Damak, which in the first part of the 20th century was so often represented by glass and collected by people, was replaced by this mosque. And this is a much political mosque. First, it's the mosque of Shuhada, the mosque of the, the martyrs mosque, the martyrs of the independence war, of course. You have this cupola. According to the taste at that time, but this was for the people, conveying modernity. 
because we, you f will find cupola in other parts of the world. The traditional Javanese mosque don't have cupola, don't have minaret too. It's a completely different building. Um, so this mosque still exists until now. It was modern because, because of the, the building itself. In the lower part, you have places for teaching and reading. And here, in the middle, you have the place for prayer. So it was a new way, a new kind of organizing uh, uh, the building itself. Uh, traditionally, the place for teaching and learning is outside, not below. So it was a very modern building at that time, which was built in the early 1950s. And here you have a car. And the question is, why do we have a car here? And do we have trains sometimes? No, no trains, never. The car is not a tool for pilgrimage. This is not a place for pilgrimage. Here, the function of the car is completely different. It's just a presentation of modernity in the 50s, in the 60s. At that time, people who uh, began to be able to, to, to afford photographs, these poor people I was speaking about at the beginning of my talk, they go to the city and they, to the, to the photographer, to get photographed with, behind them, buildings, apartments, and sometimes there were uh, small cars in wood sitting on the car and pictured in the car, as if they can have and drive a real car. So this is the function of this car, completely different, not for, not for traveling, not for transportation, just as a symbol of the modern times. And very realistic. The pictures were taken from, from magazines, and sometimes it's even possible to know the, uh, the model of the car. And here you have the name of the painter and the place where he was living. So I finish with this uh, and the, the, the next slide, which are more political than the former one. The former one is political too, but this one is a little bit older, older and more political. Something happened in, the, uh, in 1686, uh, a clash between the Dutch and between the Javanese Sultan. And during that clash, a Dutch officer was killed by uh, uh, a Balinese officer of that uh, Javanese uh, uh, king. The name of uh, this Dutch officer is François Tack, Captain Tack, who was killed, which was a catastrophe for the Dutch. They didn't want to be at war with the, with the Javanese, but they, they, they didn't know exactly what they could do, and they were expelled from the, the, these places in central Java for years. For the Javanese, it was a kind of victory. Okay, this happened in 1686. In the first part of the 20th century, this event was frequently recalled by nationalists as a proof. We defeated the Dutch in the past, in the remote past, and we still are able to defeat the Dutch. Here you have the fight on the left, the Dutch, on the right, the Javanese or, conversely, the, 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 the Javanese and the Dutch. It's always the same scene, always. Always with François Tack, the Captain Tack here, killed by that Balinese officer, Untung Soropati, the Balinese officer of the, of the Javanese Sultan. You always have this guy, which is a, must be a Javanese soldier, kept by the Dutch. Um, so, the, the, the way of representing this event is always the same, with flags. Here the flags are gray. Why? This was probably produced in the 1930s. In the 1930s, the display of this event was forbidden by the Dutch police. And I think that the, purposely the painter have put gray color on the flags to avoid to uh, 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 get this, this painting considered as a political one by the Dutch. This must have been painted later, after the independence, I think. 
The, 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 the Javanese part of the battle, they are ulama. All are ulama. And this uh, shows the role played by Islam in the fight, in the struggle for independence. The last, uh, yes, the censorship, right. And the ulama here. And uh, as the last one, you have here the Prince Diponegoro, which was a Javanese prince who led the uh, war against the Dutch for five years in the first half of the 19th century, with, uh, which uh, left the, the central Java bloodless. It was a, a war, a terrific war between the Javanese and the Dutch. The Dutch, they won. And uh, the prince was uh, uh, exiled to uh, Makassar and then to, to Manado and then to Makassar, to, so to the Celebes. Of course, in the 1920s and 30s, this figure was considered important by the nationalists in Indonesia. And this explains why in 1949, one of the major contemporary painters, of modern painters of Indonesia, Basuki Abdullah, he, he made this painting of uh, Prince Diponegoro representing the prince in the battle. This painting was made in a single exemplar, of course, kept in the museum. But anyone could want to have it at home. That's why it was reproduced on glass, widely reproduced on glass here. This from the same model, same painting, but affordable to the many, which is not the case for the painting uh, on canvas here on the right. Voilà. Uh, so this is the last slide. So what I want to... Uh, to uh, I want to focus to uh, simple ideas. The first one is the importance of modernity and uh, the link between modernity and glass painting. The second one is modernity is not Western and material modernity only. The Ottoman and the Japanese were conveyors of modernity too. Ideas in other ways or in showing the agencies and the interest of mixing materials as we have seen with the first slides. Uh, the second one is we can use iconography on glass as a source for history of Java in the second part of the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century, as we would use newspapers, archives, and anything else. And glass painting, I haven't shown show you a lot of glass painting representing uh, Mahabharata, Ramayana, and whatever, and the, the shadow theater. But glass painting has preserved a lot of, uh, a large part of the Javanese iconography, which has completely disappeared now. The main reason is iconography on paper, uh, paper is not long lasting because of the climate, just like here in Thailand. After a few decades, it's just, you cannot, cannot see anything, out if, except it has been kept very, very carefully, but usually it's not the case. So glass is fragile, but it's a, uh, very useful to keep on the long term images which cannot be found anymore on cardboard, on leather, and on paper. I think I have forgotten a lot of things, but uh, it will be for another time. Thank you. Please raise your hand if you have any questions. Well, nobody? Well, thank, oh yes, please. Thank you. I'd like to know how do they actually paint on the glass? Because in one picture I noticed something was on the right side, but in the glass it was on the left. Yes, you're right. I didn't explain, but uh, I should have. Um, I think you are referring to um, to the uh, Medina uh, view. No, this one. Here you have the cemetery on the left, and here on the right, uh, for instance. Um, for glass painting uh, in, in Java as well as in the other parts of the world. 
you paint on the, you will see the painting through glass. So you have to paint on the, on the opposite and you have to begin with the details and you finish with the background. And this is, well, it's not much more difficult than the, the usual way when you paint on canvas, according to the painters, it's not much more difficult. But you have to begin with the small details. And what's interesting to underline is that practically, if you want to sign your painting, you have to begin with a signature. <laughs> when you paint on, on canvas, you finish with the signature. But on glass, <laughs> you begin with it. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a reverse uh, uh, process. How did you ever get involved in this? Just by chance. <laughs> no, there is no specific story behind this. Just uh, I was interested in it. I discovered glass painting in Java in the late 80s, early uh, 90s. Um, well, just I was interested in it. And friends of mine heard that I was interested in it, so asked me to write on it, and I began to do re serious research on it later. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you so much. Um, two, two questions you can choose. If you, so one would be, I thought the uh, connection you made briefly, but tantalizingly between the glass painting in Java and Senegal. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could say a little more about that, perhaps? It would be great. Mm -hmm. And then another more specific question about the representations of in the the two um, kind of like Nang Talung characters. You know, the, I forgot their names. And the women in the beginning oh. bit of modernity. Yeah, those two. And, and the so, yeah, and then the subsequent slide. It could, so. This one? Yeah, and the next one, where it actually shows a combination. Uh, uh, you just went through the family scene, uh, paying homage to the... Yeah, yeah there. Yeah. Because, so, so you were pointing out kind of the localization of more European, Western, modern yeah. aspects. But what I also think fascinating from a completely ignorant point of view is the fact that they've decided to retain the symbolic characters and facial features whilst the women here are depicted naturalistically. So yeah. is, could you explain yeah. that yeah. perhaps? Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, okay, the old models for that kind of painting are taken from this journal, uh, Kajawen. It's a magazine, Kajawen. And uh, Kajawen, uh, they published a lot of stories just for fun. Stories of these characters, specifically here, uh, Samar, which is the father, and uh, Petruk and Gareng, which are the brothers and the sons, okay? And with their wives. And there is a lot of uh, 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 illustration with these stories. And what we see is the women are wearing, let's say, traditional uh, clothes, so with uh, uh, kubaya, the upper part, and with a, uh, a cane. It's not a sarong, it's a cane. The name is a cane. Okay. Um, what's Western here? Maybe the, uh, here, the bag, or maybe the shoes, I don't know. And as for men, they always mix both. Not always, sometimes they are completely, completely Western, no, yeah, completely Western, completely Javanese, and sometimes they're mixed. And when they're mixed, the upper part is European and the lower part is uh, 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 Japanese. But we should say, uh, wait, I, I should add something. At the end of the 19th century, in the very early 20th century, the, uh, the natives were not allowed to wear European clothes. It was forbidden to them. Yeah. And for a long time, it has been forbidden. And they were not allowed to have shoes and they had to walk uh, 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 with the uh, uh, feet, naked feet, barefoot, yeah. Um, it's changed at the be beginning, very beginning of the 20th century. It was a way by the Dutch to, 
show the lower status of the native, natives compared to the Dutch. So it was a fight for the, for the Javanese who they had the right to wear other clothes. And the same holds for the Chinese and much more for the Arabs. They had to wear Arabic clothes to be shown and to be identified at first as uh, Arabs. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I, in the 30s, it's not really political anymore at the time of this, this, these pictures or this illustration. At that time, relationships between Dutch, between the colonials and the locals began to change. Uh, more and more uh, Javanese were able to speak Dutch not the majority, of course, huh? but they were able to speak Dutch and they, they, they could speak directly to Dutch. Uh, and it was acceptable at the end of the 1930s. It was acceptable to the Dutch to be addressed and be you know, asked and to, well, to speak directly with the, with the locals. Yeah. So uh, I think there is no, nothing politics behind this. Huh? But you're right in making a difference between men and women, uh, and it remained the same for a long time. Uh, as for the first uh, question, uh, um, Japan and uh, uh, Senegal, um, I don't think Japan is very important, actually, except for these uh, uh, Japanese glass paintings produced during the Meiji era and important to uh, the Netherlands Indies. This is the, the only link, actually, I would say. And maybe it wasn't identified as Japanese by a lot of people who were owing it, uh, or only, uh, the, the owners in, in, uh, in, the, in the Indies. Mm, for Senegal, it's different. It was introduced approximately at the same time as it was in Japan. We developed at the same time. So the last decades, very last decades of the 19th century. And um, uh, it's very strongly linked to Islam in Senegal, much more than in Indonesia, much more than in Java. But the, the Senegalese, they don't have Ramayana, Mahabharata, and, and Shadow Theatre, you know? So it's very strongly linked. So you will find a representation of Mecca and Medina, sometimes the same as I've shown here, exactly the same, because taken from the same models. Um, and you have a, a special link with the, uh, the Brotherhood, the Brotherhood from Senegal, uh, uh, with, uh, and with portraits, portraits of leaders, portraits of people. And this is another difference with Java. I, I think there is no real portrait painted in, on glass at least, but maybe not, only, not on glass only, in Java before the 1950s. Except even for the king, it's not really, it's not realistic at all, you know? And, um, uh, it's just the, the idea of a couple, the idea of the king, and no, he, maybe one of the first heroes who were represented and widely distributed on paper, not on glass, was uh, Prince de Ponegoro, uh, with another portrait, not that one, not that one I've shown, but another one which is much more well known where he sits, and this portrait was made by a Dutch uh, uh, draftsman. Yeah. So, um, a link, not a direct one, but because of context, because of uh, similarities in context. Uh, in Senegal, the glass painting was... Uh, the, 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 the French tried to, to limit the use of prints uh, or to, yeah, or prints related to Islam. They were very aware of the... It was considered as a danger. Uh, so there is an indirect link between uh, Senegal and, uh, and Java. Another difference is in what happened to glass paintings after, in the second part of the 20th century, it became, uh, um, well, there is, we cannot speak about revival in, in Senegal because it never died, really, but uh, you have uh, very famous painters who begin to be active in the second part of the 20th century, Westerners, they do buy the painting, they collect it, with the name of the painters, uh, uh, whereas in Java, most of the painters are anonymous. We don't know the name, we don't know the place. And um, 
with the kind of subject of themes completely different with Java. So the uh, later developments of glass painting in Java and in Senegal are completely different, but still alive in both countries. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that interesting presentation. I just have an observation of one of the glass paintings that you displayed of Jerusalem and uh, Mecca. Um, of in, in, in Islam, I think um, there are three holy places, and one is Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. And uh, perhaps the two mosques from Jerusalem is displayed along with Mecca is because uh, before Muslims, the direction for prayer or the Qibla is towards Mecca, so all Muslims face towards Mecca and pray. Yeah. But mm. before that, the original Qibla was towards Jerusalem. Mm and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So it was later on that the Prophet received a revelation and the, the direction of the Qibla, the direction of prayer, could have changed to Mecca. So perhaps that is why Jerusalem is given importance here. Um, mm -hmm. And the, sec uh, the second one is a question. Is, um, you, showed, uh, you said of how uh, these glass paintings are used as protections uh, by families outside their homes. Uh, through your collections, have you ever sort of observed uh, surahs or Islamic prayers actually incorporated in paintings that contain uh, Hindu uh, gods and Hindu figures mm -hmm. as well? Yeah. Thank uh, you. For the, the first part, the remark, you're right. Uh, uh, Jerusalem plays an important role in Islam as the first direction for prayer. Um, but it, it is an interesting hypothesis you make. It could be the case. I would say another one is uh, this representation avoids dealing with the prophet. Uh, and uh, as we know, therefore, the, uh, uh, the Wahhabi, well, uh, the prophet, they don't put such importance on the prophet as uh, uh, do other, other, other believers. Um, maybe, but I'm not sure because... This was made in Java, evidently, with influences from the Ottoman painting here. And uh, I think it is not related to the Wahhabis uh, because of dates. The Wahhabis, were, well, it begins in 1924. Well, it begins much earlier, but they were much more visible after 1924, of course. Maybe, uh, maybe because of the... Um, the the painter himself, maybe he felt unable to, to represent Medina. There are a lot of hypotheses, but yours are interesting, yeah. Uh, the second one is uh, regarding the, uh, so these protective uh, devices and the presence or not of uh, Indian gods, right? Yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the only uh, example I could give is, uh, was in the very beginning of my presentation uh, with uh, Ganesh, or Ganesha, as people say in Indonesia. Oh, no, it's before. Yeah. Voilà. Here. Um, well, uh, if we speak about uh, Ganesha in the present time or in the 19th century, so at the time where uh, all Javanese were Muslims and not uh, Hindu anymore, which happened in the 17th century, it's a long time ago. And in Bali too, which is still Hindu until now. Um, well, Ganesh is an important uh, figure as uh, uh, protecting for health and conveying uh, uh, knowledge. Until now, uh, Ganesha is the symbol of the uh, ITB with the Institute of Technology of Bandung in, in Bandung, in the city of Bandung, it's Ganesh, yeah. as a symbol of knowledge. In Bali, it's uh, very often represented at the entrance of courtyards to protect against uh, something bad coming from outside, uh, diseases or whatever. Uh, and here, this is, can be found in Cherbon and in Cherubon area only. I never seen it outside. Uh, it's a, you have the head of Ganesh, the, the, uh, the body is of a human, and he's wearing um, usually 
It's not very visible here. Uh, usually he has a fan in the left hand, a royal fan, small one, in gold. And in the right hand, he has a sword, which is the sword, a Muslim sword, uh, the sword of uh, Ali, Zulkantain. So uh, 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 I don't know in English, bifid, a sword in two parts, you know. And on the sword is written the, uh, uh, the, um, the Shahada. There is no God but God, and then Muhammad is his prophet. So it's completely mixed. Huh? And this is protective. They have other protective figures in Cherbon, other than this one, and other protective figures with animals or beings mixing uh, uh, different, uh, different animals. Uh, one is name is Paxi Nagalinam. It's a mix of the bird, Paxi, Naga, the dragon, Liman, the elephant. It's, it, uh, yes, uh, it's very nice, but anyway. And, um, uh, but I've never seen it in, in other places. And all these uh, figures have their own name. So the name of this one is uh, Srabat. This Srabat is the name of this figure. And others have other names. So it's a very old reminiscence of, uh, of Hinduism, uh, but it's seen from Java, it's marginal. In just one important city for glass painting, but just one city. Where can we see this in Java? Is there a collection or a museum somewhere in Java that keeps most of this? The, the, the paintings? The paintings. Yeah. Uh, there is very few pieces in museums, and most of it are modern pieces, pieces produced during the, since the revival times. For all pieces, you have to try to find private collections. Not that much. I would say that there are maybe four, five, six big uh, uh, private collection. I mean big with a, a number of items uh, around 100, which is not a lot at all, uh, of course, but it's, well, uh, in the Javni, in the Jin context, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not bad. Um, there is a, an Italian uh, uh, colleague who's uh, living here in, uh, in Bangkok. She, she had or she has or she had a collection of glass paintings. Uh, uh, Rosalia Scortino. She has a place in BACC. Uh, uh -huh. C junction, yes, but part of her collection is in Italy, the other part is, has been given to a museum in Vietnam. Um, well, it's, practically it's not possible. The only institution who tried to collect glass painting, not glass painting only, but to try to collect in different places in Indonesia, is a, uh, a private a foundation owned by a, 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 media, a, a multimedia group, Compass, the name of the journal is Compass, the newspaper is Compass, and they have in Jakarta um, a museum, private museum, and they have quite a lot of glass painting in Java, in, in Jakarta, and in the Jakarta, and, um, but I don't know other, other collection. It's, it's, it's a little bit difficult, yeah. That's why I try to collect and to, to, to take pictures of uh, as much as possible, because a, uh, a private collection is a, is a dead one. I mean, not for the collector, but for the many and for the public, it's the dead one. I don't know. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for this talk. We now learn more just um, the <coughs> learn more about other cultures, which is part of some society motto: knowledge gives rise to friendship, and that's a Ganesh head for you. Another one. Thank you very much, Maxi Boku.